I have a interest in looking at large scale systems that are no longer working. So that's what I did with the education millionaires. And so I was ready to write my next book. And I was like, well, what's another large scale system that isn't working for anyone? And pretty soon after my inquiry, uh, I came to our financial and savings and personal investment and retirement industry, which again is another system that's not working for anybody. In this case, the people it's not working for are on the older end of the spectrum, not the younger end. And you know, nobody is feeling safe or secure about their retirement, about their financial future. Um, and the system just isn't working. Um, you know, the most basic s- statistic around that is that uh, the, uh, the S&P 500, if you invested uh, $10,000 in the S&P 500 uh, index fund, which is what all the, the personal investment advisors r- recommend you do, is like these broad-based index funds, in the year 2000, right before the internet bubble, and you let that sit for 16 years, 15 or 16 years, right until now, uh, and you let that sit, it would be worth about fourteen or $15,000 nominally. But if you factor in inflation, you've really only gained maybe $1,000 or less over 15 years. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Michael, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, so you know, I came across your story uh, because I have known about it for quite some time. In fact, I read your first book, The Education of Millionaires, and it made me rethink my entire education. Uh, so on that note, uh, where I want to start is by asking you what the earliest memory you have is of something from growing up, uh, an experience or a piece of advice that you got from somebody that influenced and shaped uh, the work that you did later on with your life? Yeah, I would say uh, my biggest influence in that regard is maybe not a specific piece of advice, but just the way my father uh, lives his life. Um, He uh, was a um, activist in the kind of anti-war era of the 60s and 70s. uh, if you've heard of the Pentagon Papers, mm-hmm. um, he was a guy who released the Pentagon Papers uh, to the New York Times. Um, so he was kind of like the original whistleblower. A lot of people today say that um, people like you know Edward Snowden are like the Daniel Ellsberg of the Internet age or Julian Assange or Bradley Manning because um, he was kind of like the original whistleblower um, you know, back before the Internet. So I grew up with this uh, incredible example of somebody who just lived his life based on what he believed and and his ideals and his values and his principles. And he kind of let the chips fall where they may in terms of, you know, what his career was going to be or, you know, what was going to happen to his income from living out of his values and his principles. And, you know, I can't claim to have done something as you know, courageous or earth shattering as what my dad did back in the day. But his values really did seep into my life insofar as I've always really prioritized uh, focusing on, like, why am I here? What do I want to do? What mark do I want to leave on the planet um, before I'm gone? And then everything else will fall into place. And, you know, if, as long as I'm doing that. You know, if I have to, you know, crash on friends' couches or, you know, live at a low level materially or whatever, um, I don't want to do that, but I will because it's worth it if you know you're doing what you're meant to do. Hmm. So that raises so many questions, as you might imagine. Uh, So what did you figure out uh, was the mark that you wanted to leave on the world and how is that sort of affected your entire trajectory of your career and led to all the things that you've done as an author? 
Thank you. That's a great question. I, I knew early on that it had to do with books. Um, I was raised in a family of authors. My dad's an author. Um, my half brother's an author. My aunt's an author. Uh, everyone's an author in my family. And I grew up literally surrounded by books. If you go to the house uh, that I grew up in, which my parents still live in, it's every wall, like floor to ceiling, wall to wall books. So I kind of absorbed books. I was a bookworm as a, as a teenager, um, and I knew that I wanted to be writing books. That was just really natural to me. Um, and I started writing seriously when I was 15, nonfiction. I've never written any fiction. I'm, I'm horrible at fiction. <laughs> but uh, I started writing essays and personal essays and that kind of thing when I was 15. And around the time I was 25... Um, I decided, okay, I've been at this for a decade now and, you know, I'd probably put in my, maybe not 10,000 hours, but I'd probably put in my 5,000 hours by the time I was 25. And, uh, I, I decided to put together, um, a, a book of my personal essays, which detailed kind of my crazy twenties with, uh, kind of sex, drugs and rock and roll, not so much rock and roll, but sex and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I, um, the book got rejected 22 times. Um, some of the rejections were quite harsh, uh, but I just was, I just kept going and I knew that I was meant to write books. And that's when I got the idea for the power of eye contact, which was my first book. Um, and the reason I decided to write a book on that was that I had gotten a lot of press for this series of singles events I had put together called eye gazing parties. And they were like singles events where you go and you gaze deeply into other people's eyes and hopefully a spark happens. So I got all this press on that and my thought process was like, okay, well, the personal essay thing didn't work out. Um, what can I write a book on? Well, the press seems to think I'm an expert on eye contact and there's never been a book written on eye contact, so I'm going to do it. And it worked. Um, and I wrote a book. People love it. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's a good book. Um, but to that point of like, what's the mark you want to leave? Um, <clears throat> I'm really proud of all three books that I've had written and published. Um, the power of eye contact, uh, the education of millionaires, which you just mentioned, um, the last safe investment, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, I still, I still don't feel like I want to write one book. That's like, I call it my Michael was here book. Like if I croaked, you know, the day after it got published, I would know I, I just had written one book that was really like m exactly encapsulated, like why I was here and what I was meant to do and the mark I was meant to leave. And I actually think my fourth book, um, the one I'm working on now, which I could talk about, we could talk about uh, later in the podcast, has my best shot of being that one. But that's not to knock the other books. It's just, it's just like which one is like the most like coming from the essence of of why I'm here. So you mentioned earlier that part of what you inherited from your parents was this commitment to living in alignment with your values, even if it meant sleeping on friends' couches, you know, less than ideal financial circumstances, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm really curious, you know, having had the vantage point that you did from writing a book like The Education of Millionaires, um, from being exposed to the wide variety of people that you've clearly been exposed to, why you think it is so many people are willing to continue living in out of alignment with their values when it comes to their work? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it has to do with fear of the unknown. Um, so, you know, people are raised in an educational system, and I write about this in the, in the Education of Millionaires, that really encourages you to stick to the line, you know, don't, don't take too many risks, um, you know, just go to school, you know, get your A's, go to college, get a, uh, you know, get a safe job. Um, we have that same programming from our parents. Now, our parents want us to be safe. Like that's, that's like the number one prerogative of a, of a good parent is to ensure the safety of their children and everything else, you know, happiness and fun and bliss, all that is great. But like at, when it comes down to it, our parents, if they're good parents are there to keep us safe. So that's kind of their job as parents. So naturally when a kid comes and says, Hey, you know, I have this dream and I want to go start a business or I want to write a book or I want to go save the world and, you know, stop hunger in Africa or whatever it is. You know, the parents have this, 
have this dual reaction usually because part of them is really happy that their kid you know, has all these ideals and is creative about something. But probably the larger part is this fear reaction of, oh, my God, my kid's not going to be able to survive. They're not going to pay rent. They're not going to have food. Like, let me tell them, you know, instead that that, you know, they should go become an accountant or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it is. Um, so we get all this programming um, telling us one thing and very little message the other way. I mean, I was lucky that I got a lot of that opposite messaging um, as a child, but I, I was lucky. You know, most kids don't have that. They get from school and from their parents and from their cohort of friends uh, that are kind of just moving through the steps, lockstep, and they don't they don't get any counter messaging. So I'm hoping that this podcast and um, obviously your podcast and your work in general um, serves as a, as a counter message. So that raises a question of um, two things. When you were looking at the people that you studied for the education of millionaires, did you find that they were people who also received counter messages or did you find that they were people who were unable to, are able to undo the programming? And if so, how did they, how did they do it? Yeah, it was mostly the latter. Um, very few people I've met ever <laughs> ever received the counter messaging uh, from their parents. I, I guess I was, like I said, just lucky in that regard. So the question is, well, then how do you pop out of that messaging if you don't, you know, if you don't have um, the fortune of you know having your parents support the kind of alternative, more creative route? Uh, and you know, these people in the education of millionaires. Um, for people who haven't read it yet, it's a book about people who either dropped out of college or didn't even go to college and became self-made millionaires or billionaires. And in most of them, what I saw in common was that at some point they had a realization, a light bulb moment, and they said, basically, you know, this sucks. Why am I doing this? Like they, they saw all their friends and their family kind of stuck in the rat race and, uh, you know, going to work at the same job that they hate and going to school and studying things that feel totally irrelevant. And at some point they just, and I can't explain why it happened to these people and not others, but they all had this moment where the light bulb went off and they said, wait a minute, this, this really sucks. I'd rather, you know, this isn't really worth living for. This isn't worth anything. You know, I'd rather take some risks and and do something great. And if the worst thing happens, it doesn't work out. Well, I'm already kind of like it's already not working out because <laughs> I'm not happy. So <laughs> so let me at least try to make it work out in a way that makes me happy. Hmm. So, you know, I think the light bulb moment is interesting. And I've asked people numerous times why we often miss the light bulb moment. But that's actually not the question I have about it, because I feel like a lot of people get the light bulb moment and they don't do anything about it. And I'm curious what you found in these people that you studied that enabled them to do something in the light bulb moment. Like, how do they mitigate the emotional challenges of doing something so risky? One of the words that came to me when I was interviewing these people was, um, was hustle. And, you know, the hustle can have a bad connotation too, like a hustler who's cheating people or, or, um, you know, not ethical, but in the good sense of it, it's somebody who really prioritizes another word I like is scrappy, you know, just kind of like down and dirty duct tape, like scrapping together a solution, and uh, all these people had an enormous amount of hustle. And it's not something that's taught in our school system. And it's questionable whether it even could be taught. I mean, I don't know how a teacher would teach hustle. Uh, but these people, you know, they got the message. And they, they just realized that there's, there's a certain uh, joy in just taking the challenge of putting something together, even if it's not perfect, even it doesn't end up working out, that actually is a joy in and of itself. It's, it's more fun probably than, you know, going with your coworkers after work and having a beer or, you know, watching TV or whatever it is that most people do to numb out after their nine to five jobs. You know, these people found entertainment in just hustling. And, and, you know, if you, if you start to enjoy that form of activity, it, it becomes, it becomes like a thing in itself and then good things flow from that. Hmm. So 
I have to ask you about what your perspective is on our education system, given the book that you wrote, uh, and kind of you know what has been uh, what has been the feedback from the educational community, and what do you think is wrong with it? What do you think we need to change? Do you think it's even going to change? And should everybody go to college? <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lots bunch of, of questions. questions. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I want to say is if. If you want to have a career that requires a college education, so currently you have to have a college degree to go to medical school and become a doctor. Same thing if you want to be a lawyer or an engineer or a research scientist. So there's certain careers where you have to go to college whether you like it or not. So clearly, if you want to do one of those careers, yes, you should go to college. <laughs> right. um, if you're, But that, that's a minority of... 17 and 18-year-olds who know that they want to be doctors or lawyers. Um, if you're in the much larger group who either doesn't really know what you want to do or maybe you do know what you want to do and it's something very creative like starting a business or being an artist or uh, starting you know, a, a, some kind of social movement or activism, then to me it's very questionable whether you should go to college right away. Uh, for a bunch of reasons. One, it's very expensive. Um, and, you know, kids, the average amount of student debt that kids are graduating now is about $30,000. That's a lot of debt for a 22 year old without an income. Um, you know, and I think one should think long and hard whether you want to start your working life with 30, 40, 50, or more thousand dollars in debt. Um, w especially when, you know, if you're just figuring yourself out, you know, you could figure yourself out doing volunteer work, which doesn't cost anything. You could figure yourself out, you know, trying to write a novel, which might not get published, but it doesn't cost anything. You could figure yourself out starting a business. Um, and, you know, all these things are, are – or just getting a job. That's actually what a lot of people in my, in my uh, book did is they got a job. And what, by the time their friends were 22 looking for a job – these people already had, you know, four years of work experience under their belt and, and some savings. Instead of debt, they actually had savings. So there's so many options for finding yourself, exploring what you want to do uh, other than college that I think in general, most people who aren't really sure what they want to do with their lives, which is probably most 18-year-olds, should go and do – again, there's that word scrappy or hustle. Like they should go out and hustle and – and not spend, you know, another four years in classrooms. Yeah. Well, I, I happen to agree with that completely as somebody who got an MBA and learned that business school teaches you nothing about running a business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, and one other question you asked is what was the response from the educational community? Yeah. Uh, well, it was mostly, as you can imagine, very negative. Uh, one funny anecdote is that, um, the, the, President of Brown University, Vartan Gregorian, when I was at Brown, mm -hmm. wrote a, uh, a a blistering attack on my book. It, he hadn't actually read it. It was pretty clear from his uh, from his review because he just says things about the book that if you had read it, you wouldn't he he would have known were not correct. But anyways, he wrote this attack on maybe the title of my book or something uh, in Time Magazine, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I got several college presidents writing attacks, but I also got a lot of people saying, hey, you're right. You know, college is a mess right now. You know, you have the whole Bernie Sanders campaign mm -hmm. to a large degree is being fueled by young people who feel they've gotten a totally bad rap, uh, a, a bad deal. I mean, um, you know, with the college debt they've accrued and, uh, and, and they're seeing that, you know, that they really got screwed in a lot of ways. Um, it's just not, it's, it's not working at all. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a broken system and it needs to be reimagined from the ground up. That kind of change is going to happen. You know, we had Adam Grant here recently, and of course, because he's a professor, I asked him, he said the biggest challenge they have right now is the incentives to change the system aren't strong enough for the people who benefit from being within it. Totally. Yeah, there's um, even the debt system uh, is highly incentivized to keep it going because what happens is you you create lots and lots of liquidity for young people to have access to um, to loans for college education. So what happens? Well, the colleges they know that they they have a captive audience with access to high levels of liquidity, so they raise their prices, and so then it's this up this kind of 
negative spiral where then the people have to borrow more and then the colleges know that there's more money available so they raise their prices more and now you have the most expensive college in the nation last I checked this may be a year or two old but recently it was Sarah Lawrence which is a small uh, liberal arts school in New York Mm -hmm. and it was $60,000 a year wow Think about that. Sixty thousand dollars a year. That's that's a quarter of a million dollars, more than a quarter of a million dollars to educate an 18 year old to get them ready for the workforce. Hey, I've got news for you. You can be ready for the workforce now without spending a quarter of a million dollars to get a, a, a resume that's going to look like almost everybody else's resume. And will get, it will make you lucky to get a, a unpaid internship. Like you, I mean, you probably know about this from, you know, just your own experience going through this system. Yeah. Like the people are literally fighting for unpaid internships to get their, you know, their toe in the door, their foot in the door after spending a quarter of a million dollars on the education that was supposed to get them a job. Yeah, it's, it's unreal. I mean, I, I am of the belief that the entire thing is going to cave in at some point. Yeah. I'm like, how long can you keep lending and having people not give back before it all falls apart? Yeah, and it is caving in. I mean, whatever you think about Bernie Sanders, you know, here is a a candidate who was seen as having no chance, mm-hmm. and now he's you know pro- posing a credible threat to the establishment politics. Totally run, as far as I can tell, by the energy of young people who are sick and tired of. The system that's not working for them and that's screwing them over. So whether you know whether he gets elected or not, it's clear that that there's a groundswell that's happening uh, that is going to you know that's that's going to turn into a really big wave. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know if it isn't already. Yeah. Well, I actually think that makes such a perfect setup to talk about this entire concept of the last safe investment. So um, where I want to start is, you know, sort of where you arrived uh, or how you arrived at the thesis, the main sort of core thesis of this book. Yeah. So uh, I have a interest in looking at large scale systems that are no longer working. So that's what I did with the education millionaires. And so I was ready to write my next book. And I was like, well, what's another large scale system (laughs) that isn't working for anyone? And pretty soon after my inquiry, uh, I came to our financial and savings and personal investment and retirement industry, which, again, is another system that's not working for anybody. In this case, the people it's not working for are on the older end of the spectrum, not the younger end. And, you know, nobody is feeling safe or secure about their retirement, about their financial future. Um, And the system just isn't working. Um, You know, the most basic statistic around that is that uh, the the S&P 500, if you invested uh, $10,000 in the S&P 500 uh, index fund, which is what all the the personal investment advisors recommend you do, is like these broad-based index funds, in the year 2000, right before the internet bubble, and you let that sit for 16 years, 15 or 16 years, right until now, uh, and you let that sit, it would be worth about fourteen or $15,000 nominally. But if you factor in inflation, you've really only gained maybe $1,000 or less over 15 years. It, the 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 annualized return has been about one point five percent above inflation over fifteen years. That that's the backbone of our entire retirement system: is put money in, let it sit there, let it grow, and here we have a period of time which we're not out of yet, mm-hmm. where a, a fifteen years, which is about a third of the average work span, the 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 system the the returns have been you know almost zero close to zero that's a that's not a retirement system that people can count on at all maybe it worked in the you know the 80s and the 90s and but it's not working in the 2000s or the 2010s uh and so we need to completely rethink how we think about uh saving investing and making sure we have a secure future hmm. 
Okay, so let's get into the things that we should invest in um, and get into sort of the what you call the super skills. So I, I want to tease apart the framework for the book for anybody who hasn't read it, uh, just because I like I can't wait to dive into this thing. Like I said, full confession, I didn't get to read it, but I got to look at the uh, like at the introduction, and I was like, okay, I really want to start understanding this now. Yeah, well, that's perfect because the, I can explain it to you then in a way, assuming that you haven't read it, which is probably the same for most of the listeners now. So, so we can just break it down in a really basic way. All right. So let's start at the very beginning of it. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so uh, you start basically with earning every you know every. Uh, system, whether it's the traditional system or our system, you've got to have some money that you earn, uh, you know, to invest. Um, now the traditional system, which we call the financial advice commonly delivered or fact, uh, or you can pronounce that however you like, <laughs> uh, uh, is th- it goes from earning to saving. So it basically says, take, you know, whatever you earn, whether it's 50,000 or 60 or a hundred thousand or whatever, uh, save as much of it as possible. Don't go out to dinner. Don't go out to movies on date night. You know, watch a video instead. You know, cook at home. Comparison shop on where the best deals on gasoline are, and do all these. You know, don't drink lattes. That kind of thing. Sit, put all the money in the you know in the in your four hundred one k in these index funds, and then watch it grow. Well, we just talked about how that works. But another reason it doesn't work aside from the fact that the returns aren't there anymore, is that people really have a hard time saving. You're supposed to save like 10% of your income. Very few people do that. The, you know, the average savings rate is more like one or two or 3% at most. Uh, and so, you know, it's very hard to have a system where the first thing you tell people is deny yourself, don't have any fun for 40 years, and then you can have fun in retirement when you spend it. That's just, it's a non-starter. People don't follow it. Mm -hmm. So what we recommend is you, you know, you earn your money and then you spend it, but you spend it in a way that kind of acts like an investment. So that's the subtitle of our book is spending now to increase your true wealth forever. So people ask, well, how can you spend to increase your true wealth or wealth? Well, the answer is uh, there's a form of sp- we're not just talking about going down to Target and buying you know your next uh, <laughs> home entertainment system. That's not going to lead you to wealth. But what we talk about is what we call systemic spending. And what we mean by that is if you look at your life as a system, as a whole system where all the pieces interrelate, you've got your work, your social life, your health and energy, your creativity, your romantic sexual life, uh, your uh, spiritual life, uh, all these things together. And the interaction of all of them hopefully creates some form of happiness in your life. Uh, And if you're not happy, then this is where you're hoping that you're going to head towards is some form of happiness where all these areas of your life are working together. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the main goal here. When you ask people, why do you want to have money? Why do you want to become wealthy? Usually in our experience, they say uh, some version of they want to be happy, they want to feel free, and they want to feel secure. Happiness, freedom, and security. Those are generally some version of those, the three things people look to have money. So our thesis is you got to look at your whole life as something that is going to generate these things. It's not going to be just the savings in your bank account that's going to generate happiness, security, and freedom. It's it's everything in your life, from your health to your relationships to your your spirituality, if you have a spiritual path, to your creativity, to your work, to everything. And you can actually spend your money in a way that is in alignment with work, having all these things work together. So, for example, uh, you know the the traditional system says you know don't don't spend money try to spend as little money as food as on possible you know save that money well our system says no spend money on food but spend it really wisely on quality food spend it on healthy food that gives you energy and if you spend that money that way that is that's actually it it transforms it from spending to investing because now you're investing in your health which is one of your, these assets in this system of your life. 
Now you're investing in your energy, which is going to radiate it, radiate out into every other area of your life. And so you can look at almost any area of your life. And if you, if you see it in the context of the whole system of your life, you can actually find ways to spend that, that end up investing in that whole system and cycling through, through the whole system of your life. So you're creating more of this, of the value in all these areas that matter. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. You know, it's really interesting to hear you say that because um, we had another guest here uh, named Jim Bunch. He talked about, you know, everything in your life is an environment and every other environment, all the environments work together, like one impacts the other. Uh, yes. And as you were saying that, I, I thought about, you know, the fact that I, for the longest time, hesitated to buy this really nice pair of Beats headphones. Yeah. And then I realized, I was like, oh my God, I'm a writer. I go to Starbucks every day. That was hands down one of the best investments I made in my productivity. And it was a hundred bucks. And I, I realize now that that was really not just a purchase, but an investment. Totally. So let's take that as a great example. So you go to, go to you know, 100 financial advisors and say, hey, I've got this great idea for an investment. I want to I invest $100 in a pair of Beats headphones. And 100 out of 100 of those financial advisors are going to sit you aside and say, well, that's really nice, but... That's actually not an investment. That's consumption. If you want to invest, you got to take that hundred dollars and put it in this four hundred one k that we manage for you. Um, but if you ask us, uh, <laughs> it could be an investment, not necessarily. Yeah. If you just took the headphones and you just sat around and listened to music all day with them, that would be fun, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. But it wouldn't be an investment. Mm. But you point out how it can be an investment is if you take that spending, and then you import it into a different context, which is not entertainment and music, but is work and productivity, you can, it, it can pay off. And let's say that that, you know, that, that increases your productivity by 10% in a day, you know, you get 10% done more because you're in a flow and, um, and, you know, you're just doing more. Well, over a year, you know, that could be, that could be worth, you know, $10,000 or more. And each year, year after year after year, it could be that that hundred dollar investment is paying off, you know, with a multiple of a hundred times possibly, or 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 even a thousand times over a lifetime. I mean, I don't want to get carried away here, but the right. point is, you can get returns that are a lot higher than the one point five percent a year we've been getting on this S and P per average over the last fifteen years. You know, it's interesting, um, and I, the reason I brought up the nine environments thing is it just makes me think. You know, this guy said every and everything in your life is an admire, environment. Everything you see, smell, hear, taste, or touch, and every time you upgrade one environment, it starts to affect the other ones. He said that's why your car should be immaculate. And you know, just listening to you say that, I'm like, okay, you know, so it makes sense to buy nicer clothes. Uh, I had a friend who was telling me. He said, you know, when you get on a flight, he said you should actually dress up. You never know who you're going to meet in the airport. Yeah. Well, there's another example. So you know, somebody who already has a closet full of nice clothes and, you know, uh, you know, a hundred pairs of nice shoes or whatever it is, probably their marginal return on investment for another pair of nice, another nice suit or another pair of shoes is pretty low. But if you live in the Bay area where I live mm -hmm. and you see the way most 20 somethings go to work and they look like they just got off, you know, a skateboarding event or something, it's quite possible that by just upgrading their personal appearance a little bit, they're going to actually find that they're taken more seriously in the meetings and that they, there's a sense of personal pride in one's appearance. 
uh, that, you know, that, that ensues from in that, in that case, probably the marginal return on upgrading one's wardrobe would be quite high. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've talked about the investment component. Let's talk about this idea of super skills because this is really mind blowing to me. Um, I I look at this and I'm like, Oh my God, this is all, these are all the things that nobody ever teaches you in a school classroom. Like all the things (laughs) that nobody at my business school learned how to do. I'm like, these are so important. So let's get into, you know, sort of at a high level, what these super skills are, and then we'll do a deeper dive into each one. Sure. So just as a, a background, uh, so our argument is we, we talked about the spending side, uh, and our argument is that if you um, if you spend wisely inv- or invest wisely, as we're talking about, not only do you get more value out of the spending, but you also you um, you start earning more. Like your example of the headphones and the productivity, uh, and so our argument is it's it's actually easier to earn more rather than to save more. Almost all the financial advice is about saving, 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 saving. Our financial advice is about earning. Earn more, earn more, earn more, and then you won't have to save as much and you can spend systemically. So on the topic of earning more, the way you earn more is you invest in what we call the super skills. And super skills are skills that are universally valuable. That they are valuable. Almost anybody in any career, in any industry, in any kind of market, bull market, bear market, whatever, uh, will find these va- these skills to have a, a high likelihood of increasing their earning. And we contrast that with what we call market skills, which is the specific skill that you trade on to earn a living. So that might be uh, graphic design or being a lawyer or, you know, whatever it is, those are market skills. Uh, but super skills are going to be valuable no matter what job you have. Mm-hmm. And so the four main areas of super skills we talked about are, um, uh, interpersonal super skills, creative super skills, technical super skills, and physical super skills. Uh, and so, uh, these are, like I said, Areas you can invest in that are likely to pay off no matter what career you're in. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of the interpersonal super skills. Uh, so that would be things like uh, building a social network, networking. Uh, that would be sales. You know, sales is an interpersonal discipline, mm-hmm. um, and uh, that would be um, you know just kind of developing a tribe, investing in your community, your you know the people that. Um, that are around you. Uh, that would include leadership. Is this is this interpersonal skill? Pers- uh, persuasion in general, interpersonal skill. Um, you know, public speaking, that kind of thing. Um, these are likely to have a very high payoff for you, no matter what career you're in. Hmm. So. I have one question about interpersonal skills, and this is—I'd meant to ask you this earlier when you mentioned the yeah. eye gazing parties. What did you yeah. learn about interpersonal skills from your experience holding the eye gazing parties? <laughs> um, well, most people are really nervous and bad about eye contact, um, <laughs> and um, you know, we created an environment where it was more safe for people to probably have more eye contact than they've ever experienced in their life. Uh, what I learned from that whole experience of, you know, spending a couple of years, like really creating events where eye contact was, you know, was explored in the, in, you know, in the deepest ways possible, uh, is that it, a lot of it really has to do with emotional vulnerability. Uh, you know, that's a buzzword now vulnerability and you hear all these, you know, Ted talks and things on vulnerability. Well, what does that actually mean? What it means is allowing yourself to be seen um, including in the parts that you're kind of scared of or not that aren't the most um, positive, uplifting parts of yourself, allowing all of yourself to be seen. Uh, and, you know, the cliche is the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, it's actually it's actually true. Uh, it's, it's a cliche because it's true. If you want to look at somebody, if you really want to see the essence of somebody, you're not going to look at their toes or you're not going <laughs> to look at their neck or, you know, whatever. You're going to look at their eyes. That's where you look at the person as a whole. And 
people, I think, are afraid of eye contact because they're afraid of all of them being seen. They're afraid of, oh, well, I have, I'm in, I have these areas where I'm insecure. I have these areas where I'm afraid. I have these areas where I'm ashamed. And we're afraid of those being seen. And so what I learned is, you know, one of the most powerful uh, interpersonal super skills, and this was before I wrote this book, uh, is just increasing your comfort with being seen. Incre- and I don't mean seen physically. I mean being seen on an emotional level. Uh, being and how all of us, all of our fears, all of our, all of that dark stuff being seen, along with the parts of ourselves that we love. Hmm. Well, what about the creative super skills? Yeah, so creative super skills. Um, if you're almost any job that you're that you know that you might have, except for you know a checkout person at uh, you know at a grocery store, but as soon as we're kind of above that level of jobs. Uh, then it's very likely that that if you learn to integrate creativity into your working s- sphere, eventually you're going to earn more money. You're going to come up with interesting ideas, interesting solutions, creative problem solving, and you will get promotions. You will be seen as someone who's creative. Um, so there's um, you know there's there's like we really recommend. Uh, having some kind of creative discipline that is independent of your work. So something, whether it's painting or singing or dancing or, um, you know, whatever it is that, that gets you seriously engaged with the creative process, because there's no substitute for actually being engaged with your creative process. Um, And in our view that um, that actually can you know can help you start to become more creative in your work life too if you if you intend that to be the case if you if you really think okay how can i bring what i'm learning in you know this art form i'm learning how can i bring the basic messages the basic principles of that into the creative problem solving the lateral thinking that's necessary uh at work so again like most if you go to most financial advisors and you say hey I want to spend some money on dance lessons and that's going to be my investment. You know, they would say, well, that's ridiculous. That's not an investment. That's consumption. And you should be cutting it back so you can save for your retirement. And we say, look, within reason, absolutely go spend your money on those dance lessons. Spend it on the singing lessons. Spend it on the painting or whatever kind of art form, the guitar or whatever it is. Um, not because you're necessarily going to pursue some fantasy of being a famous guitarist or a famous dancer, but because a it's enjoyable in its own right. It's a, it's a f- source of value that has inherent value, but also it has value as a means to more creativity at work. So that's, so there's, you know, there's a bunch of, um, creative super skills. Storytelling is a big one. You, you told me, you know, just how, important storytelling is, uh, in your podcast, uh, the people who, you know, who have great stories are usually the ones that are most compelling, uh, for your readers, uh, your listeners. Um, so, you know, storytelling is a form of creativity, um, writing, you know, people who are good writers, who are good copywriters, uh, that's a form of creativity. Reading we talk about, um, is, is not in itself necessarily a creative act, but it's sort of the raw fuel for creativity, um, is, is reading a lot. Um, so there's all kinds of creative super skills you can invest in. So let's talk about the technical and the physical ones, and then we'll get, uh, into a few other things and start wrapping things up. Yeah, great. So, um, so the technical super skills, and this is, I need to be clear here that when we talk about super skills, we're not talking necessarily about like learning a specific programming language. That would be a market skill. If you learn that language, you can get a job doing that type of programming. Um, but for, um, for technical super skills, um, we talk about, uh, one of the ones we talk about is, um, you know, really learning the discipline of marketing. Um, sales and persuasion is an interpersonal skill, but marketing is a technical skill, like learning about split testing, learning about funnels, learning about, um, you know, all like all the kind of things that go into increasing sales. Those are that's a technical skill set. 
that is going to be valuable in almost any field you're in, as long as you're above like the super entry level. You know, if you have any kind of management, if you have any responsibility um, for you know getting ideas um, propagated throughout, you know, among your customers or throughout your organization, you're going to want to learn about the techniques of marketing because it, it's just you know being persuasive is almost always going to lead you to better things in your career. Um, another technical super skill is learning about systems thinking. Um, and that's, you know, our whole, our whole basis of our model is systems thinking. And it's like that, the guy you were talking about with how every environment is a system that works together. Um, you know, systems thinking is a discipline. It takes a certain amount of onboarding to get used to thinking about how each action you take impacts all these other actions and, and areas of your work life or your entire life together and kind of starting to see how all the things interact into a whole. Um, that is a, that's a technical super skill. Um, and, you know, financial modeling is a te- technical super skill that will probably come in handy no matter what you're doing. Um, basic web design, you know, we're not talking about being like a pro web designer, but just knowing the basics of how to set up quality websites is probably at this point, something that qualifies as a super skill that's going to be valuable in almost any context. Um, so those are the main ones. And then what about the physical ones? Uh, so the physical ones are basically anything that has to do with your health and vitality and energy. Uh, so that, is again, that's going to be valuable in almost any context. Um, so learning about mental focus, um, we talked about, you know, kind of up leveling your, your, um, physical appearance. And you know, this isn't necessarily about going out and, you know, dieting and going on a crash workout program to look like a model, but you know, there's basic ways you can invest to up level the way that you're presenting yourself to the world uh, in, uh, physically, no matter what weight you are, what you look like, things like, you know, having up leveling your wardrobe, um, you know, those kind of things. Um, and, uh, we talk another one, you know, one of the most basic ways to increase your income over your lifetime is to increase the span of your working life. So, you know, 65, really is starting to feel young to a lot of people. You know, if you meet 65 year olds these days, they don't feel like they're about to go to the retirement home. You know, 65 is a very vibrant age these days. So if you can increase the through health things, through, you know, eating better, investing in better food, investing in exercise, investing in preventative health care and wellness, if you can make it so you're happy to work up to say age 75, which I think is seems pretty realistic these days, then you're adding 10 years of productive life onto your lifespan. Uh, even if you're only earning $50,000 a year by that time, uh, that's adding another $500,000 to your lifetime income. That, you know, that's, that's, it's hard to think of other investments that can have that kind of payoff. Hmm. Um, and I'll also say we're probably the only business book ever written and maybe ever written in the future that has a whole section on how investing in your sex life is a great investment. (laughs) Um, and the, and our argument there is that, you know, this is an area of tremendous, that, that, that is, you know, tremendous importance to most people. Uh, it, it has a potential to give an enormous amount of happiness in your life. Uh, and it just increases your vitality. Like, you, you know, if you're at the workplace, you know, you could tell, who's coming in on a Monday morning refreshed because they just had a really sexy (laughs) weekend, right? You can tell like, there's just something that gives you that extra, um, spark when this area of your life is going well. And you can actually invest in classes and courses and workshops and therapy. If you need to have therapy, whatever it is to get that area of your life, um, you know, going strong. Um, so again, we believe like all these things work together, to increase your happiness, to increase your income, and to create a, a, a total system of your life that where every part is working together. So you have two last sections of the book called The Advisor, Equity, and Tribe. So I want to finish by talking about those and then uh, wrap up by talking about what the implications of all of this are for our future. Great. 
Um, yeah. So, it, so this is so far we've talked about kind of the earlier part of the career, uh, like you're earning money, you're saving, you're building up uh, the system of your life, you're spending, investing to create this life that all works together for you. Uh, but then the question is, okay, well, eventually I want to not have to work all the time, and I want to, you know, enjoy. Um, a life that isn't so dependent on these time-based commitments of work or I want to retire. Uh, so how can I do that? Uh, well, you know, you definitely need some savings in the bank to retire, of course. So we're not against savings. Um, our argument is that you're more likely to save if you earn more. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's easier to save if you have a bigger pie to save from. Um, and if you kind of learn to spend in these systemic ways rather than always needing to go to Best Buy, you know, to, to make yourself happy with a new, you know, a new big TV screen or whatever gadget you're going to buy. So, you know, so savings is a big part of it. Uh, but we also believe in developing what we call advisor equity. And this is uh, basically equity in somebody else's business or career that you have earned through advising them on all these super skills that you've learned. So if you're in your 30s or 40s and you've been following this plan that we lay out, um, at some point you've developed enough skill that you're actually going to be really helpful for a younger entrepreneur, say in their 20s, uh, to help them with their business or their career. And there's, you know, there's so many 20 somethings now starting businesses and they need support. They need help from people who've been through the ropes. And so our argument is, uh, that you can take what you've learned, uh, from all of this and then start advising younger entrepreneurs, the next generation of entrepreneurs. And through that, you can either get what's called formal advisor equity, which is, uh, essentially, you know, some amount of formal equity in in the businesses you're advising uh, that comes about through your advisorship position. Um, it's not uncommon to receive, you know, half a percent or one percent equity uh, if you're taking on an active advisorship role, mm-hmm. or what we call informal equity, which isn't a formalized deal, but it's still it's more like a debt of gratitude. It's like you're investing in having a lot of people out there who are really grateful for the way you've helped them. And that's going to come back. That's going to be whenever you need a favor or, uh, whenever you need, you know, you, you need some help on your business or whatever it is, you're developing kind of a network of people that feel grateful for, for the help you've provided. Um, and that kind of, that gets into the, the other area you mentioned of tribe, Uh, And we think tribe is really like one of the most important concepts in our book is that developing not just a group of friends, uh, not just a bunch of people that, you know, and go out drinking with, but a really tight knit community, a tribe of people that are really there for each other over time. And this doesn't have to be in one geographic place. Uh, It can be, you know, dispersed over over different areas, uh, different cities that you visit or whatever it is, but really having a consistent group of people where you're investing in each other's success. And, you know, this is one of the most powerful forms of security that we know of. Um, we, we like to say one of the measures of your true wealth is how many couches can you, can you crash on for how long? Because, you know, so many people, they're afraid, oh, I might lose my house. You know, I might not be able to make my mortgage payments and they're afraid of going out into the street. Well, if you have a tribe, you know that you'll, someone's always going to have your back. In fact, a bunch of people are always going to have your back. You're not going to be out in the street. You're always going to have some place you can call home. You're always going to have people who support you. That's really the benefit of developing a tribe. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, as I was listening to you talk about the advisor equity piece, I think that, and I know this because this was my own experience, I think in our minds we have this sort of idea that we need to become Tim Ferriss before we can do something like that. And I came to a realization at a certain point that nobody was going to hand that opportunity to me. I had to go out and seek it out myself. And I actually went to a few friends who run a show called IDLM in which, you know, if you're listening and haven't checked them out, you should. And I asked them, I'm like, can I advise you guys based on my experience? Because I bet I could help you. Yeah. 
and totally. it's been incredibly rewarding. Like I, I honestly, it's one of the, it's funny because I look forward to the chats that I have with them every week. I learn so much just from talking to them. Yeah, absolutely. And you get, are you, are you, are you getting uh, an equity? Nothing yet. Of equity? No, no, at yeah. the moment. No, but I mean, I'm getting a lot out of it. Like I'm learning yeah. a ton. Yeah. And you're, and you're developing relationships that will last over your lifetime. And likely when you need some support or you need, uh, you know, especially if they really, um, if the, the company hits, um, you know, by following your advice and they, they become successful, then when you need something, you're going to be able to go to them. And it's not a tit for tat, but it's Mm -hmm. just a general sense that you've provided goodwill and they're going to provide it back when you need it. This has been epic. I, I really, really have, have enjoyed talking to you. Uh, so I have one last question, which is how we finish all our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. Uh, what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I think it is finding that spark within where you you realize, you know what, the, the world would not be the same if, the, if that little spark within me wasn't expressed. Um, and it, it, maybe not the world, maybe it's just your community or the people you care about. But w- what's, what's that thing where if you weren't here, if you were never born or if God forbid, you know, you died earlier or whatever, you just weren't here. Uh, what's that thing that we missing from the world? What, where would that, where would there, there be a U shaped hole in the world if you weren't here? And, and most people, when they look around, probably the things they're doing at their current work situation do not express that spark, do not express that essence. And so whether you are able to make that as your form of income and your work, or whether it's something you do on the side, I really, really, really think it's pretty much one of the most important things you can do on the planet is find that thing that, that you, that is unmistakably you and, if if you weren't doing it, nobody else would be doing it, and there would be a U shaped hole in the world. What is that thing? And you may not find it right away, but if you keep trying, you're going to find that thing. Mm. Well, uh, this has been phenomenal. Uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and share your insights and your story with our listeners. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Yeah, my pleasure. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.